I think it's important for new writers who are just starting out and querying or even getting an agent or their first contract to know that like it's it's not all sunshine and roses once you get your contract. There are there are bad moments, but there's also plenty of good ones to balance it out as well. So Welcome to Queries, Qualms, and Quirks, the weekly podcast that asks published authors to share their successful query letter and discuss their journey from first spark to day of publication. I am your host, Sarah Nicholas. I hope you're enjoying the podcast and the stories authors are sharing with you. If you are, please consider leaving a review on your podcast app or sharing this episode on social media. If you're interested in supporting the show with a couple bucks a month, go to patreon.com slash pubtalklive. Kate Bellinger is the award-winning author of the Seven Range Shifter Paranormal Romance series, where she weaves captivating tales of dark, sexy heroes who are cowboys by day, wolf shifters by night. When Kate's not writing, intense and riveting paranormal plots or high-voltage love scenes that make even seasoned romance readers blush, she can usually be found with her nose buried in a good book. She lives in Florida with her husband and two young sons. So please welcome Kate. Hello. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for coming on. All right. So we're going to start by going all the way back to the beginning. When did you first start getting interested in writing? And then how long did it take from there before you started getting serious about pursuing publication? So I found an interest in writing uh, rather young. I was about 11 years old when I wrote like my first short story, like novella. And uh, funny enough, it was a paranormal (laughs) and it had a love subplot. So I was already kind of on the track to being a paranormal romance writer, I guess. I just didn't really realize it at the time. But I wrote that short story mainly because at this period, my, um, my mom and my aunts were all big romance readers. And so were all my older cousins. And I was feeling excluded from the party because I was the young one of the group. <laughs> so I decided, well, if I can't read these uh, racy romance stories, I'm going to write one of my own. <laughs> uh, so it ended up being this like little YA like paranormal novella. And um, I put that aside. It was kind of like a little phase I went through for a couple months at that point. Didn't really pick up writing again until later in my teens when I was writing some like creative essays and like to try and get scholarships. And I was always a big reader during that time. So books were still a major, major part of my life. I always really loved to read. I had a creative writing um, and English teacher at the time who read one of my little stories that I had written to submit to college and was like very encouraging to me and said, you're really good at this, you know, you should keep going. And so that encouragement was very helpful and kind of key in giving me the inspiration to do that. And it was around that time that I was graduating high school and um, going into the summer leading into my freshman year of college that I decided that I was just going to try and write a book. Like (laughs) it just got in my head that that's what I was going to do. And so once I had decided to do it, I was going to do it. I'm a really goal oriented person. So once I had set my mind on that, it was going to happen. So I just started chipping away at really bad chapters of um, what ended up being my first novel. It was a YA uh, paranormal romance sort of fantasy. Yeah, it was really bad. (laughs) But I had so much fun doing it that I just got interested in writing from there. And At the time, I had entered into college as a Spanish major, and it wasn't long afterward that I switched to English and uh, creative writing minor. Nice. So you went to college for English and creative writing. Mm -hmm. Did you know right away that you wanted to publish a book, or were you looking at other career paths? I think I knew right away that I wanted to publish a book because the whole reason that I had decided to go into that particular like major is because I had enjoyed writing this book so much. So I always kind of thought that writing was the first goal, but like I had backup ideas that like I could either teach writing or I could be, you know, an editor or work in the industry some way if, you know, for some reason writing didn't work out. So 
it was always going to be something in the publishing industry, but writing was always the main goal and like everything else was backup. So how did you learn more about the publishing industry? Like how it works, how to go about it? I know they usually don't teach stuff like that in creative writing programs. So yeah, they don't typically teach you that sort of thing in English or creative writing programs. Even once I was in graduate school working on my MFA, they really didn't talk too much about publishing. The focus was mainly on craft. So at the time, I wanted to know everything I could about the publishing industry because I was hoping to get my book out there. So I just started reading a lot on agent blogs were a big thing at the time. And, you know, any forums I could get my hands on podcasts were not really a thing yet at that point, but any sort of information I could come across. And then I saw an advertisement at my local bookstore for a uh, chapter of Romance Writers of America. So at that time, I was a part of RWA and I joined that local chapter. And that really taught me a lot about um, the industry as a whole. So then what happened? Can you break down for us kind of your journey from then to signing your first book contract? I kind of foolishly started (laughs) querying that first novel that I wrote because I think I was convinced at the time that it wasn't quite as bad as it actually was. (laughs) Once I had a handle on the process, I wrote my query letter. The manuscript was already finished. So I decided that I was just going to start researching agents and trying to query and pitch. So um, I queried that YA novel for on and off for probably about a year and got a lot of very, uh, what we call encouraging rejections, right? Um, so a lot of full requests um, that later turned into, no, this just isn't for me. Paranormal and YA was kind of crowded at the time in the post sort of twilight boom. Mm-hmm. So there really wasn't a whole lot of space for new voices in YA paranormal at that point. And I was kind of seeing that those responses reflected by agents of like, oh, this is really good, but I don't think I can sell this right now. Or, you know, it's just not for me, but it's well written. So I think those encouraging responses kind of made me feel like I should keep pushing forward, even when I was facing all of that rejection right? Because I mean, it was just rejection after rejection. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But the fact that I was like, seeming close, I guess, motivated me that like, okay, maybe I can actually do this if I keep going. At the time, (laughs) I had kind of fallen into a uh, misconception in the industry that romance is easy to sell is what I had heard (laughs) from people. Now, if you know anything about the romance genre, you know, that's not true, because it's a super crowded marketplace. And there's dozens and dozens of people like right all trying to get these spots on in traditional publishing for romance. I really didn't, you know, know what I was doing thinking that I could publish a romance any easier than a YA. But I had in my head that this was going to be a thing at the time. And I really enjoyed reading um, adult paranormal romance novels, even though I was writing YA primarily. So I decided, well, I'm going to try my hand at writing an adult paranormal romance since this YA isn't really leading anywhere. So then I wrote uh, what was then titled Skinwalkers, (laughs) which was a uh, first in a paranormal romance series that later became um, called Twilight Hunter and was published with Harlequin HQN. So I wrote that book, it was completed, but before I started querying it, I decided that maybe a better method of getting the book out there would be trying to pitch in person at conferences. That year, RWA Nationals was going to be hosted in New York City. So a lot of industry professionals were going to be there by proxy. I talked uh, my mother into sort of sponsoring me because I was a broke college student at this point. So, and my mom always really believed in me. My mom has always been a big cheerleader for me. So I kind of talked her into the idea that we should go do this. And so she and my siblings and I kind of made a fun trip of this. And we went to the RWA con in New York City and they kind of had a vacation 
while I went to the con. So I had pitched at the formal sessions that RWA sets up for authors, um, but it wasn't actually at any of those sessions that led me <laughs> to eventually end up with my agent. I was on a literal elevator ride and <laughs> looked over, <laughs> yes, an actual literal elevator pitch. And I looked over and I saw this agent, her name was Mary Sue Seymour. And I knew that she did not represent my genre because I knew that there was a uh, Amish romance writer <laughs> in my chapter who wrote for her. But despite that, I just kind of said hello, you know, politely introduced myself just to be friendly. And so we struck up a conversation on this, you know, elevator ride, just chatting friendly about the conference. And then she asked me, of course, well, what do you write? And so I told her that I wrote paranormal romance and I gave her my quick elevator pitch. And she said, well, I don't rep paranormal romance, which I already knew, <laughs> but she referred me to her co-agent, um, Nicole Rissonetti, and says, gave me her card and says, you should tell Nicole that I told you to query. When I went home from the conference, of course, that was one of the first things that I did was I sent out my um, requests that I'd got from those formal pitch sessions. And then I also sent over a query to Nicole. So she requested the full manuscript. I sent it off, you know, thinking it was going to be at least a couple months before I heard back. And then I got a phone call from her 24 hours later <laughs> saying that she had opened the manuscript on her phone that morning and started reading and then just kept reading until the end and that she wanted to rep me. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, it was an amazing call. Like, so of course I did what everybody does when they get the call and I cried and like was all excited and super happy. I had obviously some submissions out with other agents at the time. So I notified them and kind of waited to hear what they had to say. I did get one other offer, but in the end, I decided to go with Nicole for a few reasons. One, because she was so excited about my work and I could just tell when talking to her that she was really in love with the book. And it meant something to me, right, that she was the first one to offer, that she wasn't just kind of just going along with the crowd. And on top of that, she was also a newer agent and actively building her list. And to me, you know, personality wise, she came across as like very hungry to like earn her place in the industry. And that's what you want in an agent. You want somebody who's going to be willing to like, you know, fight for you and their other clients. And so we just meshed really well. And I ended up signing with her and she is still my agent now. So, and it's been over 10 years at this point. <laughs> All right. So you signed with Nicole and then uh, what happened from there until uh, signing your book deal? So when I signed with Nicole, she wanted to do some preliminary edits before we took the manuscript out on submission. So she sent me like a detailed sort of editorial letter and comments in the manuscript. And once I had incorporated those and we felt that the manuscript was really as polished as we could get it, then we decided that we were ready to take it out on sub. And so it went out on sub, I want to say around somewhere between like November and like January, somewhere in that time frame. I'm not quite sure exactly the date when she sent it, but I know we were starting to shop around then. And then it was about May of 2012, starting with shopping in November of 2011, that we got an offer. Several other offers came in, um, and ultimately we ended up signing a deal with Harlequin HQN uh, for a three-book deal. So it was pretty amazing. <laughs> Yay. So what did you do when you got that call? Same thing I did when I got the call that Nicole <laughs> was going to rep me. You know, jump around screaming like, you know, happy tears, right? <laughs> Funny enough, when she got me the call that the very first offer for the series came in, it was not Harlequin that was the very first ones to offer for the book. Um, it was another publisher. And when she called me then, 
I was working late nights at the time and she called me early morning and kind of woke me up. And so I was all groggy (laughs) and uh, did not quite have the reaction that she was expecting from saying, hey, you have your first (laughs) offer in. But like I was half awake. (laughs) I was pleased. Mm -hmm. I was very happy, but I was not quite as exuberant as she was anticipating. (laughs) But with the Harlequin offer, you know, once we got that initial offer, we knew that she was going to go to the other editors who had the manuscript at the time and tell them, you know, that we had an offer on the table. And so we were waiting to hear back from several. And we knew that Harlequin was taking it to acquisitions, but we didn't know whether it would get past acquisitions or not. But Harlequin was really our target for that book. Even when I wrote Twilight Hunter, I had like the Harlequin like series stuff in mind. I was actually, when I wrote it, intending for it to be like, I think it was part of the Nocturne like series line at the time, but then it ended up being so long that they wanted it for a single title, which was a in and of itself a dream come true because HQN is like a really big line there. So it was pretty amazing to get that news and I remember being really excited and like watching Twitter and seeing that the head of the line at the time made some tweet. And I was like, she's subtweeting me. Like she's tweeting about me. <laughs> like I had a feeling and I was right. She was. And so they. what did she say? She said that she was taking something to acquisitions that she was super excited about and was like very hopeful that this is going to go through. And I was like, that's got to be my book because it's going to acquisitions today. I was convinced that it was me and it was right it was right I talked to her after the fact once they'd offered it she was like that was you I was tweeting about you so watch Twitter is an important lesson there (laughs) (laughs) oh my gosh can you read your well partially successful query letter for us because originally it came from an elevator pitch (laughs) yes yeah it was it was it it was started from an elevator pitch to mary sue and then i sent this query letter to nicole it's kind of a i think a a funny way to start off, but I started off the query with a sort of definition of the paranormal creatures I was using in the novel. So it says skinwalker, noun, one, a being capable of assuming the identity of an animal, two, Norse god of mythology, and three, shapeshifter. And then I launch into the query from there. So I'll just go ahead and read what I wrote. Werewolf hunter Jace McCannon has one loyalty, the Execution Underground, a council of fierce supernatural hunters sanctioned to protect the greater Rochester area. Despite his half-wolf lineage, Jace devotes himself entirely to his job, and he hates nothing more than the monsters he hunts. But when a search for a sexual sadist turns ugly, Jace finds himself face-to-face with the Rochester werewolves' packmaster, and now he's jonesing for a night with his sworn enemy. The only alpha female to ever run Rochester's pack, nothing stops Frankie Amato from protecting her clan, and she's dead set on massacring the rogue murdering women in her area. After ascending into leadership following her parents' brutal murder, Frankie's eager to prove she can hold her own without the help of any men. Until a run-in with a handsome werewolf hunter leaves her captive and begging for release. With a burning attraction and a relationship that moves between one step forward and two steps back, Jace and Frankie work together to end the murders. Their only chance falls on Jace's shoulders. He needs to embrace his half-werewolf nature and shift for the very first time. But when Jace's attempts at shifting reveal an unknown bloodline, not a werewolf's blood at all, this news drums up Frankie. Frankie's own dark past, and she'd rather stand on the sidelines than at Jace's side. At 72,000 words, Skinwalkers is the first novel in my paranormal romance series, The Execution Underground, which follows the romantic lives of multiple supernatural hunters. Although Skinwalkers is the first in a series, the story stands alone and would appeal to readers of Sherilyn Kenyon's Dark Hunter novels and J.R. Ward's Black Dagger Brotherhood series. 
I hold a BA in English with a minor in creative writing from Stetson University. I am currently a graduate student at Spalding University, working toward an MFA in creative writing for children and young adults with dual genre study in adult fiction. I'm also a member of Romance Writers of America, where I'm involved in many critique groups and writers workshops. I am an avid reader and maintain a well-read book blog where I review novels in the paranormal romance genre. I'd be happy to send the full manuscript or submission package upon request. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to hearing you. I should note that I started the query letter, of course, with Dear Miss Resinetti, and I spelled Resinetti right. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, of course. I'm glad to. So how has your experience been since signing your contract? Were there any surprises along the way? Yeah, I think there was a fair amount of surprises. Um, It's been lots of ups and downs since I got my contract. I think it's important for new writers who are just starting out and querying or even getting an agent or their first contract to know that like it's it's not all sunshine and roses. Once you get your contract, There there are bad moments, but there's also plenty of good ones to balance it out as well. So, you know, it's been a bit of both. So now it is time for our quick round. I call it author DNA. It really has nothing to do with DNA, but it's just kind of the little classifications that we use to talk about writers sometimes. So the first question is, are you a pantser or a plotter? A bit of both, but more a plotter. (laughs) Do you tend to be an overwriter or an underwriter? Early in my career, I was an underwriter. Now I'm an (laughs) overwriter. Are you more of a morning writer or a nighttime writer? Morning writer. When you start writing a book, do you start with character or plot or concept or something else? Usually concept, and then I go to character and then plot. Do you prefer coffee or tea? Tea. When you write, do you prefer silence or some kind of sound? Silence. When you are writing your first draft, are you more of a get it down kind of person or a get it right kind of person? Get it right kind of person. (laughs) (laughs) I wish I was a get it down kind of person. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, just a side note about how long does it take for you to write a first draft then? It really depends on what you count as part of the like, quote, unquote, writing process, because I spend (laughs) a lot of time thinking about the book up front and like just imagining scenes. I'll do a process typically where I'm just like jotting random scenes that come to me down on note cards and kind of putting them up on the storyboard in like different and interesting ways until I figure out the one that's key. And I spend a fair amount of time doing that. And then I usually will write like a preliminary back cover blurb or like loose synopsis for the book, which doesn't always end up being the actual synopsis of the book, but it kind of gives me a guideline of where I'm going. And then I actually start drafting. And that usually starts out very slow, where I'm getting like very tiny word counts because I'm a procrastinator. And as we get like closer to that deadline, the word counts shoot up. (laughs) And so I would typically say um, it takes me probably about two, three months to get the actual full draft down. It really depends. It varies from each book because I've had some take longer than that and some go really fast. So the last one that I um, that I wrote went very fast. And so that one I drafted pretty much in two months. But that was an unusual gift book. It was really easy to write and fun to write. And there was not a lot of hard parts to it. But those books are rare. <laughs> what tools or software do you use to draft? Typically just Microsoft Word. I'm old school. Or sometimes a notebook and just... A pen. Do you prefer drafting or revising more? I think drafting is more fun for being really creative, but I like editing because I love seeing the book get better. So I don't know that I could really choose between the two. I like them for different reasons, but I think like the true magic of it comes in like the plotting drafting stages and then like 
the editorial part is just being like proud of what I've done and like making it better. (laughs) Do you write in sequential order or do you hop around? Mostly sequential, but when I get stuck, sometimes I'll hop around if I feel like that'll help me get more words on the page. And finally, are you an extrovert or an introvert? I always score on the midline of these tests, like right dead in the center. Um, I'd probably lean slightly more toward extroverted, but I enjoy my alone time as well. That's the end of the author DNA section. All right, so the show is called Queries, Qualms, and Quirks, so we're going to get into that second cue now. What were some of the worries that you had on your journey, and were they realized, or did you overcome them, or how did they shake out? I'm a bit of a perfectionist, so I tend to have like a big fear of failure. <laughs> and so I feared like putting this book out there and it not going well. And that absolutely happened. <laughs> so, you know, my <laughs> my first book with HQN, I mean, it was set up to be a really big book. You know, I I launched with a debut beside um, in an anthology beside Gina Showalter, who's this huge name in paranormal romance. It was like a dream come true. You know, I had this really amazing editor. I got a starred review from Publishers Weekly, right? So like everything was lined up for that initial book, Twilight Hunter, to succeed. But then it did not succeed. The sales on that tanked, like I'll be honest, since this is a writer's podcast, right? And I think it's important to like, like, you know, say that there have been times when we've had books that haven't done well. So when the sales for that series went down, um, Harlequin decided that they were going to switch the series from being a full paperback run to ebook only, which, you know, as a perfectionist like me, I was like devastated, right? Like, this is my dream and my success. And I was like convinced that you know, after this, I was never going to write another paranormal romance again, right? (laughs) Like, it felt like the end of the world. But ultimately, it wasn't the end of the world. Um, I did write another paranormal romance. And now I have a series going with a different publisher that is doing really well. So I think that fear that I had that if I didn't succeed right away, that I was never going to get to necessarily write another book in the genre that I enjoyed writing was just not true, right? I think you can fail even in the way that your worst fears are realized and still get back up and be brushed off from that. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you shared that because you had a book that seems like the publisher really set it up to succeed and then it just didn't click, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, You know, and there's a lot of factors that that could have been the case. You know, I like Mm -hmm. during that kind of dark period, I think I speculated a lot about what exactly it was that made that book fail. Right. And there's no way to say. Right. And that's one of the things that you kind of have to learn in the industry is that you don't have a lot of control in that regard is that once you put the product out there, whether you're traditionally published or whether you're indie, right. It doesn't really matter. Like the readership reaction to it, like is something that you can't control. And so you don't know how it's going to be received or if readers are going to love it or hate it. Right. I think a large part of why that book didn't do well is that paranormal was downtrending at that time. And like contemporary was becoming popular because this was around like, Fifty Shades starting to be a big thing and whatnot. But, you know, I can't say for sure whether that's what it was. So, but I have those books now. I'm planning on re-releasing them as backlist. So they weren't, you know, they did not go to waste. They weren't wasted work. You know, I'm still relatively proud of the writing in them. I think I'm a better writer now than I was then. You know, so you can fail and then still keep going and things can turn around. Yeah, that was one of the toughest things for me when I was a publicist is when I realized that I could do everything I could for a book and it still wouldn't take off. Or even sometimes you would do, you know, a book wouldn't be a lead title and we didn't we didn't have as many resources to put behind it and it took off and none of us knew why. And it was always such a, you know, confusing thing to try to figure out what's going on here. And sometimes it's just the whims of the market. Yeah, 
Yeah, there's really no way of predicting success of a book. I mean, obviously, when you have a publisher putting lots of support, that increases chances of a book being, you know, a bestseller, that sort of thing. But it's no guarantee even then. Mm -hmm. So now it is time to talk about the third cue, which I think is the funnest cue. Do you have any writing quirks? Is there anything about your writing process that you think is interesting or unique or fun? I guess it's probably like my note card thing of like rearranging ideas in like random ways. Cause I do think it's interesting and kind of quirky that like I write mostly sequentially, but the ideas come to me totally out of order. <laughs> so oftentimes I will know the beginning of a book and I will know the ending of a book and I will have no idea what happens in the middle <laughs> or like, I was working on a project right now, like in the past week or so that I was plotting out. I knew the middle of the, this book, but didn't know the beginning <laughs> or the ending. And like <laughs> putting the scenes and the cards up on that board is always such an interesting process to see like where parts of the story are coming to me. And, and it's never at the start, like they're always just all over the place. And so I always think that's kind of fun and interesting is to see how you can rearrange these scenes in your head and make them make sense. <laughs> so even though you write sequentially, you plot non-sequentially. <laughs> yes, yes, I plot non-sequentially. So typically when I'm plotting, I uh, I come up with a concept and once I have the loose concept, then I start with the characters. And I'll typically write down kind of like a basic um, GMC for them. So for those who don't aren't familiar with GMC, that's goal, motivation, conflict. I recommend Deborah Dickinson's GMC book. It's a good one. And so I typically write down the character's GMC and start kind of like fleshing out their characterization because characterization is really important to me. I think that if you don't have you know, really compelling and interesting characters that, you know, it's hard to follow even the most interesting of plot lines, right? So I, as a reader, I love reading for character. So that's what I do as a writer as well as I start with the characters. And then once I kind of have a little basic idea of their backstory, that's when scenes will start sort of just popping into my head and I just write them down on these note cards and like stick them up with tape on this board and like I end up moving them around as I'm adding more scenes to that board until finally like they all come together. So yeah, I definitely plot uh, non-sequentially. <laughs> Interesting. All right. So when you were in kind of the lowest parts of your journey, what kept you going and why did you stick to it? So I think what kept me going in the lowest parts of my journey is just, I get a lot of joy from writing. I like the process. I like writing itself. And so it was kind of knowing myself and knowing that I was not going to be happy if I ever gave this up. And I also wouldn't be equally as happy throwing myself into any other career. Mm. So I think knowing myself in that way and knowing how important this was to me and how much joy I got from it was able to keep me going. Because ultimately, if you don't get a lot of joy out of writing, it's hard to keep this as a long term career because it's a hard job. And Publishing is a sometimes very brutal industry. So I think you have to really love it and be passionate about it to kind of like keep that happiness during the dark moments. Do you feel like you made any big mistakes along the way that you maybe want to share with listeners so they don't make the same ones? <laughs> <laughs> I've made so many mistakes. <laughs> so many, so many mistakes. One of the first ones that comes to mind is that I came into the industry with really only rudimentary knowledge about what goes on in publishing. Like, and I think that to a certain extent, you can only gain a certain amount of knowledge before you're actively in the process. But I think at the same time, I was kind of ignorant with the thought that I could like learn as I went sort of thing. And that set me up in <laughs> for some really like major mistakes. So one funny one is that when my editor sent me my starred review for my debut book, 
I was like, oh, cool, was my reaction. Because I had no idea. A starred review is huge. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a starred review is huge. But I had no idea that a starred review from Publishers Weekly was like a big thing or that it actually like impacted your like the number of orders you get for your book or like how many of those books get shelved. So I was like, oh, that's nice. So like, and my editor actually called my agent and was like, <laughs> what's wrong with Kate? <laughs> she was concerned. And so <laughs> my agent had to call me and explain how exciting this was. And I felt like such an idiot at the time, right? Because I had no idea that that was something that I should have been excited about. Your agent was like, you wasn't excited when I called you with an offer. You weren't excited about the yeah. start review. What are you going to be excited about? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> she was like, Kate, what are you doing? Like, And I think that really illustrates like how little I knew about like the inside of the industry. Like, I had focused so much on like just learning the query process and like how to pitch that I didn't take time to like explore the other parts of the industry. And I wish that I had. So that's one major mistake, I would say, is like learn as much as you can, even before you end up getting an agent or your first deal, because I think knowing those things along the way will both help you celebrate your successes more, but also let you know how to navigate potential pitfalls. <laughs> can you share with listeners one of the most important lessons that you learned on your journey to publication? I would say the most important thing that I've learned and that I kind of use this, I, I sent out a tweet about this actually the other day where I said that my North Star that is always guiding me forward in publishing is that if it is not something that I would enjoy reading or that I would get joy out of writing, I don't write it. And I know that sounds easier said than done, right? But once you're in the industry and like Occasionally, you're getting pressure to follow trends that you might not have originally planned to write, or you're getting offers for potential contracts for things that you know you might not want to do. Using that as a metric of I don't want to write something that I wouldn't love to read, I think is really important. For example, so I'm working on book six in my Seven Rain Shifter series for Sourcebooks. And that is my last contracted book for Sourcebooks. There's potential that we might contract more, but um, we're kind of deciding what I'm going to work on next at the moment. And so I've got a couple things out on sub and I'm trying to figure that out. Um, but one of the conversations my agent and I had as we were coming up near the end of this contract was that she said, well, you know, what do you want to do next sort of thing? And she she told me that she could very easily like get on the phone that day and sell a Western like cowboy series for me. Right. So the paranormal I'm writing right now is a cross between paranormal and Western. And I love writing that. But ultimately, I don't want to write contemporary Western and I think that a lot of writers would be tempted to just immediately go with like the easy deal and say, yeah, like if you can get me an easy deal writing contemporary Westerns, let's do it. Right. But I told her, no, that's not something I want to do, because ultimately, as a reader, while I like mixing Western with paranormal, that's because I love paranormal and I love fantasy and I like speculative fiction. Right. So I don't see myself writing anything that is not like in a speculative subgenre. And I think knowing that that's what I love to read helped me kind of, you know, stay away from potentially writing something that I wasn't going to get a lot of joy out of writing. So I call this part of the podcast the acknowledgments section. This is not a business that most of us succeed in completely on our own. Who are some of the people who helped you along the way and how? You talked about your mom, which was a great story. Is there anybody else? Yeah. So my mom, of course, helping fund my first conference is an immediate thought. But also, you know, I, I can't go without mentioning my agent, Nicole uh, Resiniti. She has been a constant 
supporter and cheerleader for me. And I think that that's something you want to have in an agent is somebody who's going to be there to kind of pick you up when you're down sort of thing. I wouldn't have any of the things in my career without the help that she's done and like strategizing where my career is at. So she's been absolutely integral. So a good agent is so important. And my husband, of course, John, he has always been very supportive of my creative endeavors, uh, whether writing or otherwise. And I think having a supportive partner, if you have a partner, is uh, really important because it's a hard career. And so they can really be there for you during the times when things can get you down and help pick you back up. Those are the first two that immediately come to mind. But of course, my editors have been wonderful. My editor at Harlequin, Leslie Wanger, and now my editor at Sourcebooks, Deb Worksman, and all the people on those teams. And my writing friends, right? My good friend, Mara Wells, who I went to uh, graduate school with, and now we're at the same agency and even the same publisher. So it's been a wild ride. And she's been a very good friend to me throughout all of it. And I've made plenty of of other friends along the way that have also been really supportive. And I think that's key. To close us out, do you want to tell us about your latest series in case listeners are interested in checking that out? My latest series is The Seven Rain Shifters, which is the cowboy wolves we've been talking about. The fourth book in the series, Fierce Cowboy Wolf, comes out on July 27th. And then the fifth book, uh, Wild Cowboy Wolf, comes out shortly after that on November 30th. (laughs) So I've got two releases in that series coming this year. There will be six books in that series total. So I'm currently working on the sixth book in that series that'll be coming out in 2022. So that's kind of my main focus right now. But then I'm also kind of working on my backlist titles to re-release those Harlequin books that are now back with me. The rights have reverted on those. So I'm hoping to re-release them under new titles and kind of update them and brush them off. So we'll see what comes of that as well. Kate, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Queries, Qualms, and Quirks. You can find the text of Kate's query in the show notes, along with links to find out more about her and her books. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review on Apple, tell your friends, or share this episode on social media. If you're interested in supporting the show with a couple bucks a month, go to patreon.com slash pubtalklive. And if you're a published author interested in being a guest on the show, please click on the home base link in the description, or go to sarahnicholas.com and click on the podcast logo in the sidebar. That is Sarah with an H and Nicholas with no H. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.